everyone, and welcome to ARC's Fireside Chat. Today, uh, we'll be spending a little bit of time with the Hope and Redemption team. Just to give you an update real quick, since the last time we were on, the number of cases inside the Department of Corrections have, has continued to grow inside the Department of California uh, Corrections of Rehabilitation. We've now had five deaths in CIM and an uptick of infections in CIW. Uh, to help in these matters, ARC has delivered 14,000 bars of soap to CIM, 14,000 bars of soap to Lancaster, and 10,000 bars we delivered yesterday to CIW uh, in hopes of being able to give something to the population that will help push back on the infections of uh, COVID-19. Tuesday, we actually launched a new campaign in conjunction with Commons Imagine Justice organization called Hashtag We Matter Too. If you Google hashtag We Matter Too, you will see a lot of activations that are nationwide asking for states across the nation and county facilities across the nations and detention centers to decrease the number of people that are currently incarcerated. This is a campaign that will be months long and it will have a number of different organizations all across the nation, and advocacy groups, reentry groups, uh, uh, influencers and other people that just want to make sure that the human beings that are currently in custody have a real chance to be able to survive this pandemic. In terms of our group today, I'd like to give you a little bit of historical context of, of, of the amazing human beings that we'll be sharing uh, our fireside chat with. So in, in 2016, I had a conversation with our founder, Scott Budnick, about how important it was to have rehabilitative programs inside that were ran by people that had been there. And we based this, or I based this on, when I was doing time in the 90s, the most powerful facilitators in the, in the, in, inside the institutions were people who had actually made change themselves. Even though people weren't being released, they walked a certain way, they led, they demonstrated through their actions that they had changed. And these were the leaders that were coming up in, in, in the 90s, in the late 90s, when there were no re real rehabilitative programs. And eventually a lot of these leaders became the guys that created many different groups inside of uh, institutions across the state. And so what I told Scott was, if we have people like that that have been released and were able to go back inside to facilities, we'd be able to shift the culture and help so many men and women come home. And Scott said, you really think that can happen? I said, absolutely. And so he said, write a concept paper. I wrote the concept paper, then wrote down, sat down with one of our, our grant writers, and we applied for innovative grant which I did not believe we were going to get. Uh, we did get multiple grants. And Scott walks up to my desk and he says, you better start uh, interviewing people because it looks like you're going to have at least seven institutions that you're going to be running programs at. And so I put out the word that we were looking for people uh, that not only had returned home, but had did a great deal of work and were leaders inside the institutions, uh, running rehabilitative programs and facilitating groups and led in a manner uh, that was really, really positive. And so we started interviewing, I think interviewed about 40 people and eventually came up with a team of amazing men uh, that have been running these programs inside. Uh, and we named that team HEART. The acronym stands for Hope and Redemption Team. Uh, literally these guys have done decades inside of prisons and ran rehabilitative programs and made the choice to change their lives while inside and then came home and continued to give back to our communities in a powerful uh, fashion. They interview for these jobs, they earn these positions, and now they go into uh, every uh, in, into nine prisons, including Pelican Bay, Corcoran, and several other maximum security prisons. I'm really proud of these gentlemen as they continue to demonstrate that rehabilitation is possible, redemption is possible, and being able to come home and live the kind of life that you want to live is possible. I want to give that historical context and as each one of these individuals introduced themselves, uh, I want you to remember this. Amongst the nine of us, there are over 273 years of incarceration. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Associate Director of the Open Redemption Team, Jacob Rivard. Hello everyone, my name is Jacob Rivard and as Sam said, I'm the Associate Director of Inside Programs. I am a former lifer. I spent 25 years in the California Department of Corrections in rehabilitation. Uh, I've served on many uh, executive bodies and uh, participated in many groups within the Department of Corrections. And since I've been home, um, I've continued to do that work. I've uh, worked in Corcoran and Kern. Uh, I've been uh, in, in institutions all throughout the state of California, as well as Wisconsin. And um, I, I enjoy what I do. 
and creating space to improve the criminal justice system. Thank you, Jacob. And gentlemen, so, so just so we can kind of give our audience a better understanding of who you are, uh, your name, how many years you served inside, how long have you been home, how long you've been working with ARC, what institutions do you serve now, and where are you currently? I'd like to introduce Jamel Carter. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamel Carter. Um, just a quick backstory. I was 1994. I was convicted of a first degree murder. I was sentenced to 30 years uh, to life. Uh, and it took me 22 years to figure things out. In 2016, I was blessed to come home. Um, uh, at this particular time, when I came home, I landed at ARC. Uh, I met Sam, who I, I had once or time doing, doing time with at Solidad. And um, uh, I shared an interest that I did want to give back. And um, they put him and Scott Budden put together the Hope and Redemption team. And I immediately wanted to sign up for that. Uh, so as of right now, I'm on the Hope and Redemption team. And I, we go back into uh, where I facilitate self-help groups uh, at uh, Centinella, Ironwood, and Calipat. And um, man, it's just my way of giving back, paying it forward, and being of service. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm home now. Uh, I made good on the promise that I made to my mother. Um, I'm, I'm adding value to my family and to my community as a whole. And so right now my life is great and I have no complaints. Man. Thank you. Thank you, Jamil. Cesar Zuniga. Thank you, Sam. So hello everyone. My name is Cesar Zuniga. Uh, I served 25 years in the California Department of Corrections. Uh, I've been home for the last four and a half years. Um, July will be, July 2000, 2020 would be three years that I have been working for ARC. Um, today, I am currently serving Ironwood State Prison, Sentinella and Calipatria with the curriculum and uh, facilitating self-help groups. And um, right now I'm at home, enjoying, you know, working from home. And I think the best part about being home is being able to spend more time with my uh lovely and beautiful girlfriend um, because when i'm on the road i'm on the road for a while so this is an opportunity for me to be more and to end it um as of april 21 2020 i am now off parole that's right that's right off parole after serving a life sentence and and, and i must say that caesar also got off parole early, early based on the work that he put in in the communities serving our community and doing the right thing Congrats, uh, Caesar. Uh, David Amaya. Hey, all right. How's it going, Sam? Hey, um, how you doing? How you doing? Good, man. Um, I, like, you know, David Amaya, in, in 1990, I was given a life sentence at the age of 21. I served 25 years. Um, the first 15 of that, I, I continued in my activity until one day I realized that I failed my daughters, and I did everything the last 10 years to become the father that my daughters deserved. And I was paroled on June 25th. 2015. I've been home five years. Uh, I got off three years like uh, Caesar got off early. And uh, I was off early and uh, I started with ARC 2017. Got a call from Sam, didn't know who it was. He offered me this opportunity to go in and facilitate. I seen that as my passion and my purpose. And uh, I jumped on the, on the thing and I go, I go into Calipat, Sentinella and Donovan State Prisons. I do that Monday through Thursday. Right now, we're currently working from home. I'm in, at a coworker, Carlos Aceves' garage. It's kind of hot in here, so if I start sweating. <laughs> and we're, we're working on the homework packets that we submitted to Sentinella, and the guys turned them in, and we're working on giving them feedback to just encourage that positive, uh, that positive change to continue. And that's my story. Hey, thank you, David. Uh, Matthew. Hey, what's up, everybody? How you doing? My name is Matthew Conant. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the age of 19, I was convicted of second degree murder. I was sentenced to uh, 20, uh, 20 years to life. I ended up doing 25 years. And just like David said, uh, it was about the 15th year. My mother wrote a letter and that was kind of the catalyst for change. And I was able to, to kind of get the ball rolling on uh, rehabilitation then. Uh, so I did 25 years. I was paroled in 2017. Um, I hit the street doing stuff in the community with the training center down in San Diego um, and just being active in the community. Eventually there was a, uh, a matter of fact, David Amaya uh, introduced me to ARC um, in regards to there being an opening and I applied. And so uh, 
obviously I went through the process. I was hired. I, I was teaching at Corcoran State Prison and Kern Valley State Prison in, um, for almost a year. And I just recently made a shift to DJJ, which is the Department of Juvenile Justice in Ventura, where I'll be helping the youth. So that's where I'm at now. I'm out here enjoying life. I'm with my wife. I understand what I did, and I'm just constantly trying to give back. So that's why I do what I do. Thank you very hey, much. Matthew. Appreciate you, Matthew. Uh, Appreciate all of you. Hey, thank you, brother. I well, welcome Eugene. And could you tell us, like, how long did you serve aside? How long you've been home? Uh, how long you've been working for ARC? And uh, what institution do you serve now? Good morning. My name is Eugene Balance. Uh, I did 27 years in prison. Um, I've been out for two years and three months. I've been employed with ARC. It'll be uh, the next three months. It'll be a year complete. Um, I currently serve the incarcerated individuals at, Kirk, at Corcoran and Kern Valley State Prison. Right now, I'm currently sitting in my mini mansion, two bedroom in Compton, California. So I'm welcoming you all into my home. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Appreciate you, brother. Hey, David Garnica, how you doing, brother? Could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Garnica. Um, I served 23 years out of a double life sentence. I've been home six years now. I've uh, been on parole for a year now. Uh, I've been with ARC since its inception, and I've been working for them for three years now. And uh, the institutions I serve as the lead life coach is Corcoran and uh, Kern Valley. And currently, I'm at the Magnolia Housing for ARC. Thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate you, brother. Carlos, can you introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Carlos Aceves, and when I was 19 years old, I had a psychosis episode. I was high on methamphetamine, and I committed a senseless, horrible, atrocious crime which landed me 29 to life. I did 21 years and I've been home five years, nine months, 15 days, four hours and 22 minutes and 36 seconds. I worked at ARC for one year, one month, four hours and 15 minutes. I'm still on the payroll and it's through the grace of God and through ARC that I'm still on parole going inside these level four institutions of Corcoran, uh, Kern Valley, Donovan and North Kern and I'm currently an SD in my makeshift office dash garage, and I'm grateful to be here, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Robert, could you introduce yourself? Now, Robert's part of the Hope and Redemption team, but he doesn't go in regularly. However, Robert's job is super important. So all of those support letters, information letters for transitional housing, our newsletter, all communications to the men, women, youth, and people that are incarcerated, Robert's in charge of that, which is now over 8,000 people. Correct me if, if I'm wrong on that, Robert. And the number is growing. So literally, Robert is that lifeline for when somebody needs to know, uh, does SB 261 or 1437 apply to me and how can I get action at uh, coming home? Uh, Robert, please introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon, Sam. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to scratch out that question because uh, Sam just answered it for me. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate, appreciate the conciseness. Uh, my name is Robert Chavez. Uh, at the age of 19, I was sentenced to a life sentence. I was fortunate enough to go to board in 2018, October, and I was found suitable on my first hearing. Uh, this October will be two years since I've been home. Uh, as Sam mentioned, I, I, I'm not like the rest of the Hope of Redemption team. They do fabulous work, but I work in the office and I stay in contact with our brothers and sisters. Uh, back in the institutions and providing them with the necessary resources and the guidance uh, for them to succeed once they once they get released from prison. Uh, where I'm currently at right now, my my, my apartment. Uh, I'm fortunate right now that my boy's sleeping. My nine month old is sleeping, so ev everything is great. Thank you, Robert. I want to introduce these two uh, gentlemen who are far away from us in Southern California. They're up in Crescent City. And so their job is unique in that they literally moved to Crescent City to be able to provide rehabilitative programming to the institution that's furthest away from any form of civilization, which is Pelican Bay. So these two gentlemen literally live up in Crescent City and they periodically come back, visit their families and do, do office jobs. But literally like right now, they're in Crescent City. Uh, these two guys are amazing in so many different ways, being able to sacrifice where, they, where they're living at to be able to help people come home and navigate what rehabilitation is really about. Uh, Mark and Joseph, could you please introduce yourselves? Yes, thank you, Sam. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Mark Taylor. 
I spent 21 and a half years in prison. I've been home one year, eight months. The day after I was released, I walked into ARC's Los Angeles office just to thank them for passing the bill that made my freedom possible. Two months later, I was hired as an intern. Two months after that, I was hired to ARC's Hope and Redemption team, which is what we do now. And currently, as Sam was saying, we work inside Pelican Bay State Prison, and we are 10 minutes away from that prison right now in Crescent City, California. And with that, I will pass it to Joseph. Thank you, bro. How's it going, everybody? Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Osorio. Uh, I spent 18 years in prison. I was not a lifer, uh, although I did go through the parole board process, so I'm familiar with it. Uh, last year, January 14th, uh, 2019, I came home after 18 years. Uh, four and a half months after that, uh, I met Sam Lewis, Jacob, had an interview, got hired for the Hope and Redemption team. Uh, and I've been working uh, with ARC. I just celebrated my one year anniversary uh, last week. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, I currently run programs with my, my boy over here, Mark Taylor in Pelican Bay State Prison. And we both live out here in Crescent City running the groups uh, five days a week. So it's pretty amazing. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Another unique thing that I'd like to share about uh, Joseph and Mark is that they're actually also graduates of Hope and Redemption programming on the inside of the facility. So before they came home, they actually went through uh, the Hope and Redemption workshops with, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Caesar and Jamel, right? Correct. Yeah. At Ironwood State Prison. Our life Ironwood coaches. State Prison. Uh, in incredible work that you guys are doing. Uh, super proud of each and every one of you. Uh, want to ask a question in terms of things that are going on now, because I know uh, as a team and as an organization, we're constantly communicating with people on the inside. Uh, Caesar, what have you, what have you heard uh, from the people on the inside right now, what have you been hearing? Um, I heard a lot of good things and, and bad things. Um, right now, as I'm helping Robert with the mailing list and people that have been, that have been calling me personally, uh, some guys are saying that they're happy because they're getting free calls and, and CDCR is being very uh, careful with, with this pandemic. And then others are just, I don't know if they're venting or they're angry, but they're saying that CDCR doesn't care. So it's, it's, I'm hearing both sides of the coin. But most of it is, is um, a lot of people are grateful that, that CDCR has taken measures to, to protect them from this pandemic. Jacob, uh, I, I want to read something from a, a, so one of our guests uh, that's doing this right now sent us a question. I want to read it to you. Could you answer it, please? Uh, she says, my husband has been on a waiting list for Criminals and Gang Members Anonymous for almost a year at Kern. I heard that your leaders have been doing packets and the guy with the guys due to COVID-19. Is it possible to get the guys waiting to get involved in these programs, access via mail and packets? He's done over 22 years incarcerated and his last 10 consecutive and, and, and he has 10 to go. He needs support and always waiting for access for recovery, but it's never seemed to come. Jacob, his, his name is Jacob Woosley. Uh, Jacob, could you address that? Uh, this is again a current. Oh, so first of all, because his name is Jacob, he got it, you know, he's all in, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, uh, we are delivering packets to Kern to the people that's in our class and our program. We also will extend that to uh, to anybody that uh, wants to do our, cl our class through correspondence. There will not be any uh, credit uh, or rack credits given for it at this present time, but just uh, give us his name and I will make sure he gets a packet and, get, and gets involved in the program. Thank you so much, Jacob. So, so I know uh, Mark and Joseph, you guys communicate a lot with Pelican Bay. Can you can you share it with us? What are you hearing from the population in, in, in Pelican Bay uh, right now? A few things, uh, as is usually the case, they're they're very concerned about their family members uh, communicating with them. Uh, uh, they're concerned about themselves too because they know you know if it gets into Pelican Bay, it'll spread relatively quickly. But the administration there has been doing a pretty good job of keeping it out of there. There's no confirmed cases. And there's also concerns about rehabilitation achievement credits. So when we were on site and went in, they got rehabilitation achievement credits currently through the correspondence where they're currently not getting that. And for our audience, rehabilitation achievement credits makes it uh, uh, so an individual can come home to their family faster. So they're concerned about that. Thank you, Mark. And, and so uh, just so the audience knows, we, we are communicating and, and trying to figure out how we can uh, make the mail package that we send in uh, eligible for RAC credits or rehabil rehabilitative achievement credits. 
If we have to set a higher standard or put, have more work done, we're willing to do that. And so we're literally trying to figure out how to make that available to the population. Uh, a statement for, for, so I want to share one other thing. So I know on the screen you see all, 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 all males on the, on, on the screen and we only go into men institutions as far as the Hope and Redemption team goes. But we do serve uh, CIW and CCWF. Uh, we don't have Norma Coupion, Cleo, Chloe, and Blair James uh, who go into both CIW and CCWF every month. Uh, we just dropped off of, uh, 14,000 bars of soap, I believe it was, to CIW. Norma and Blair were there, and they also dropped off rehabilitative uh, programming for uh, CIW. So just know that we are aware this was the original Hope and Redemption team. We're working on getting actual contracts or, or trying to get contracts to be able to serve uh, CCWF and CIW weekly. So I don't want you to think that we're not thinking about our sisters inside. We're thinking about every single human being that's inside. Uh, so please know that and please know that we're working to be able to expand our programming uh, to more and more institutions so that they can actually uh, learn from people that have, that have walked a mile in their shoes. So I want to uh, switch it up a, a, a little bit and ask you, uh, David Gornica, uh, how are you feeling and what is, it, what is this like? So how have you been feeling? I know uh, you're working in Magnolia House and one of our housing sites, but you've also been uh, sheltering at home and doing work. But like, just, just how does this feel? This is something we none of us have experienced before. How are you navigating and how are you feeling, brother? First of all, I'm very grateful to be working. In all honesty, sometimes it does tr trigger uh, being back inside and being, you know, cooped up in one certain place and being restricted. But uh, it, it's also, it's, it's helped me to... Uh, to answer more of the correspondence because I get uh, personal correspondence from some of our uh, our uh, members inside and I get uh, calls from their family members and I'm able to talk to them a little more and ease their uh, uh, stresses as well. So it, it's been a good experience overall. Thank you, David. I also want to ask that same question to, to uh, Mark and Joseph. Uh, because you're so far away, I know we communicate every day and we do check-ins and we do all of those things virtually, but still being far away and, and up near the Oregon water, like, how are you feeling and what is this like to you now? So, uh, as, as you know, we're over 700 miles away from our family. That 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 can be tough, so we're, we're very intentional about our self-care. Out here is a beautiful area. You have the ocean, you have the Redwood Forest, you have the Smith River. Uh, so we take advantage of those things. But more importantly, we, we feel the full support of ARC as an organization. Uh, everyone in the organization is always checking on us to make sure that we have everything we need to ensure that we can do our job and to ensure that we are good. So, so we appreciate that. Uh, uh, so, so we're good. We love the work we do. I personally feel I have a moral obligation to do this work. So I love it. And these are the sacrifices that must be made if we're going to end mass incarceration. Yeah, I, I, I echo that. I, I mean, the COVID was one thing. Being isolated in Crescent City is another thing. Uh, it'll never compare to what our brothers and sisters are going through uh, inside of prison, right? Uh, but it does present its challenges. And I think what, what we draw the correlation, a lot of things that we go through, especially myself and Mark, is being away from our family. Uh, it's extremely difficult at times. Uh, but the greatest thing is we have an awesome support network. If it's not our Hope and Redemption, uh, Redemption team, it's our, uh, uh, our fellow employees at ARC, it's you, Sam, it's Jacob checking up on us. Uh, and we find ways out here to do stuff, you know, whether it's going for a hike, headed down to the beach, uh, just now, like my wife came up here with me for the drive. So she has a couple months of maternity leave and it's been awesome being able to do that. So I appreciate those moments because I know a lot of people wish they could do that and we're both fortunate. Uh, so it's awesome, but it does have its challenges, but we can't complain. We have a job at the end of the day, right? <laughs> All right thank, thank you both. And, and, and I want to I wanna lift you two up just, just so people like really understand, like it takes, if you drive from Los Angeles to get to, get to Pelican Bay, it's a 13 hour drive, it's literally, like if you drive now, the normal route is you fly into Oregon and then it's a two hour drive from the Oregon border to Pelican Bay. So it's not like it's a quick bus ride or, or an easy way to get there. It, 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 it's a trek. And uh, the, the, from the heart, what you give the men in Pelican Bay, I want you to know like uh, I have huge admiration and respect for that because that says a lot for you and your character and we appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Jacob, what's the team done to adjust to COVID-19? So, so like, Matthew spoke about being shifted into the Department of Juvenile Justice, uh, and, and, and we've heard these packet things that are going on and, and, and record. Could you tell us, what did we do, or what have you done, what have we done to shift uh, to adjust uh, to COVID-19? 
so since uh, COVID-19, uh, which was uh, since March 11th, so to speak, uh, um, we've kind of recreated our program to go virtual. And we did that by uh, turning all our curriculum, curriculums into in-cell study packets, which we bring into the institution to be distributed to, to the participants. Uh, we also have started a virtual, uh, a virtual programming through a video where we are doing CGA, we're doing emotional intelligence, and we're doing, uh, we're doing criminals and gang members anonymous, excuse me, emotional intelligence and board preparation through the video screen. Uh, so we're still providing program despite COVID-19. We're making sure guys are being able to rehabilitate themselves so they can come home and become leaders within the community. Thank you, Jacob. So I wanna uh, kind of tag Caesar on this one a, a little bit too. So that adjustment, what is it, what do you see that adjustment going from here as we move forward? Uh, let's say six months, a year from now, COVID-19 is over with. What does it look like now? Oh, I see a lot of possibilities of getting our message through uh, through virtual video, uh, just for the simple fact that a lot of um, the institutions are just sharing our videos and getting a lot of positive feedback. Because what I've been reading in the letters, uh, some of them were addressed to me and some of them were addressed to ARC, where they're, it, it, it shows that they're not forgotten. No matter what is going on out here, uh, our guys are not forgotten, and they love that. I, I, I have some letters that I'm getting ready to scan to Nick where uh, they're, they're speaking very highly of all those good videos. So after all this is said and done, I believe that we, we got to continue doing that, uh, apart from us also going back in there too. Uh, David, David Garnica, a uh, question for you, man. What it, based on this, like uh, again, like you're going back and forth doing both work with, with the Hope and Redemption team, but also – uh, supporting our housing where we have uh, uh, young adults. Uh, what have you learned from this? We had to be open-minded about uh, being creative. You know, uh, I also learned that uh, the, the guys in there, they really miss us. They really miss us. I, I had wives call me, hey, hey, uh, they need some kind of, they need something, they, they need something to do in there. They need to continue their process. So I told them just, hey, we're in the process of, of sending you guys packets, so it, it's going to be all right. You know, and, and uh, and I also learned that uh, being in, at housing, it, it is different, but it, it's, a, uh, it's a great experience to be able to mentor uh, some of the younger guys coming in. I'm used to being around guys that did over 20 years, a life sentence. These guys only did four or five years, so it's a different experience and a different way of mentoring as well. So, Robert, let me ask you a question. So, so you see, like I said earlier, there's over 273 years of incarceration here. What makes us experts in this? Uh, I think that answer has become very obvious over the years, uh, especially the space that ARC has built up. It makes us experts because we live the lifestyle. Not only did we live the lifestyle, but we've been able to identify uh, why we got influenced uh, by our environment, uh, by our family members, our friends. Uh, but most, most, more than that, we've been able to detach by identifying uh, those influences and it makes us experts because uh, we understand it. We, we walk the lifestyle and now we've actually succeeded out here in society where we're providing so many different pathways for formerly incarcerated individuals coming out back to society to actually succeed just like each and every one of us has done. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, Robert. So that lived experience and, and a saying that was coined by a formerly incarcerated gentleman uh, in New York, uh, who said, those that are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. So please re remember that. Lived experience does matter a great deal. And with the proper training and the opportunity, uh, huge changes can be made in our system, not just the correction system, but just thinking about all the other different areas that we give people the opportunities. Uh, there's a question from Journey. How does a person who's incarcerated now reach out to the Hope and Redemption team? Uh, Jacob, could you take that one? A person that's uh, incarcerated can re reach out to us through mail. We still re uh, receive the mail daily. We have people, uh, we have interns and other staff that's coming in and uh, opening mail and reading them. And, and uh, uh, all mail will be answered. So uh, just to answer the question, if you really need to uh, have someone from the inside reach out to us, just have them write us a letter at the ARC office in Los Angeles or Sacramento. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Jake. I want to acknowledge K. McCoy, one of our viewers who's in Missouri. Uh, we may not work in Missouri, but there are ways, and, and, and there have been a few uh, uh, panelists or, or people that are viewing this that are asking, how do we, we uh, replicate this? Definitely reach out to us at the end of the show. Uh, uh, our tech staff will put our email address, uh, uh, arcinfo, uh, info at arc.com, I believe it is. And you can email us and ask us these questions. We will literally, like it does not have to be ARC to have these programs in every state. We can train, we can work together, we can figure out how the landscape looks differently in different institutions or different states or different cities. And we will help you. Uh, every one of our mentors uh, or life coaches are trained in transformative mentoring. Uh, and, and we used our lived, ex lived experience to, to model uh, how one, to not just come home and, and, and survive, but to thrive in, in, in our cities and communities. I want to jump up to, uh, so, so David, Carlos, and Matthew, just once, could, could you guys each give one, uh, I saw you put it in the chat box, but could you each also give one uh, transitional house uh, that a couple of our viewers are asking for in San Diego, please? For me, I went to uh, the training center in San Diego. It was a faith-based uh, transitional house. It had shut down for a minute. Uh, it got refunded. Um, and it just opened up. So that, that's the spot. Um, really good, a lot of opportunity. So. Carlos and then David, uh, give me one transitional house uh, in San Diego. You have Amity and Vista, and also the Lighthouse in Rose Trent, San Diego. Thank you, brother. David? Well, I was just going to say the, the Amity Vista, to me, that's the best one. They're more structured. They, they know what they're doing. But currently, right now, San Diego County, they won't so send letters of acceptance to any transitional housing because they don't have long-term fund they don't have funding for long-term offenders right now but they will accept you in once you come in and you go to your pro office and your pro office will direct you to one but i would say the amity vista thank you david so so i'd like to open it up to, to any of our viewers you go down to the bottom of your screen and you'll see where it says a q a we will literally answer the question Harvey Knight, one of our life coaches, uh, who also is a former lifer, he says, what's the topic? The topic is just about what the Hope and Redemption team does, what these incredible men have given their life, like literally going after spending decades inside of prisons. Now they go back in freely to help others understand how important rehabilitation is, but not only that, but how to prepare to come home and, and, and thrive and really succeed in, in, in our societies. So Jim McGrath wants to know, Jacob, how do, how do people join the Hope and Redemption team? So, um, first, to, to join the Hope and Redemption team, uh, first, 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 you got to be a lot, you, well, you got to be someone that served a considerable amount of time, uh, and then it have to be a job over. You would have to apply for it, uh, send a resume and a cover letter uh, to me, and um, then go through an inter interview process. It, it'll probably be a couple of interviews, and uh, uh, that is one way to join the Hope and Redemption team. Just as a caveat, I also wanted to just, just drop this in here, Sam. We are working on building out our women's program. I, I know it's been mentioned that there's no women up here, but we, we are working on that. Like Sam said, we do have people that are going in, but we do want to have uh, people on the, the actual team uh, as, as members. We do have an honorary Hope and Redemption team member and April Grayson uh, as a woman, but uh, we need more. Thank you. Caesar, I'd like you to answer this one. And, and matter of fact, I'm gonna call on Jamel too. So how do you guys do self-care, Caesar? Like, what's your self-care? You've been in the institution. I know you're like, you, you're in there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday night, you drive home. What is your self-care? Uh, as of now? No, when you're, in this, when, when you're actually going in the institutions, you get off Thursday night, you get home 10, 11 o'clock at night. What is your self-care for, for Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Oh, so well, uh, Friday, usually be at the office and if we have that friday off because we have one off one on um i will either if i'm off and i'm going to take some time off get some rest and then when the weekend comes uh i normally go on a hike with with my girlfriend and uh, a group of, of friends um so as of today with this COVID, the self-care that i get is after work when i clock out at four i jump on my bike me and my girl and we just ride around south central and uh you know it's a little dangerous out here so the workout is if you see people following you you just gotta pedal faster that's it <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you Caesar. jamel what does your self-care look like uh oh, man thank you for even asking that question um no doubt sam it's it's, it's, it's for my family 
I'm blessed, bro. I got both of my parents uh, home. And so to be able to add value to the conversation with my mother, it's incredible, bro. Like sometimes uh, she's shattered in a million pieces. And now I'm at a point in my life through all the, the rehabilitation I got, I could add value. You know, I could help and assist my mother in putting herself back together. I could add value to my five older sisters, you know, that struggle with problems. I can strengthen my nieces, these young, these young potential presidents, these young strong women. I could add value to them and my nephews. I can curb them with some of the mistakes that they already make or, or prevent them from going to prison. So for me, Sam, it's just spending time, quality time with my family. I, unlike in the past, I wasn't able to do that. So that's what I do in my downtime. I, I, although I, I know the answer is, I still want to, because because Mark Pope, Mark and, and Joseph post this stuff. Uh, but I still want to know for you guys up there, what does your self care look like? I would say uh, uh, what I said earlier, like the beach, the river. But what, what's real beautiful out here is the redwood forest. So on the weekend, you know, these are the most spectacular trees on the planet. I'll go deep off into the redwood forest and it's kind of like a, a meditative thing. It helps me, it helps balance me back out. Yeah, for me, uh, it's much of the same. Like if I'm here in Crescent City, then I take advantage of the beach, the cliffs, uh, beautiful scenery where you can just kind of meditate and just zone out. Uh, but obviously if I'm back home in Vegas or in LA, spend that time with my family, I love it. Uh, but one thing that really keeps me grounded and that I enjoy doing and that's part of my self care is still reaching out to my brothers uh, uh, that are incarcerated. Uh, I got about at least 20 guys uh, that I get regular phone calls from or that I'm able to write to and send pictures to. And at the end of the day, man, that, that always keeps me balanced because it puts everything in perspective for me. So yeah, thank you, Sam. Hey, thank you. Uh, so so we're about to go deep. I, I have a question in our chat box that's real deep. I want uh, you guys to also uh, answer or, or one or two of you guys answer, uh, please click on, hold your hand up, uh, little uh, icon. This is the question. So you're thriving in society. How do you respond to a victim's family who does not want you to be enjoying life in society? One of the things that, for, for me, my lifelong return for what I did is to give back to society always. Every day I wake up, I'm trying to figure out ways to make our system better, to help youth not make the mistakes that I made, to make sure that our communities are safer and better uh, than, than they were the day before. And I literally like live that every single day. So if I can help one youth, 10 youth, 1,000 youth, that's what I'm gonna do. And, and I promised myself that, that would I, that's what I would do. Part of that passion is enjoying life for me. And, and what I mean by that is to be able to see a teenager who potentially have made the mistake or, or may make the mistake that I made to help him or her make a different choice, I get a great deal of joy from that. So, so that's how I, I, I try to reconcile that and always holding myself accountable and demonstrating through my actions that uh, I, I, I took something that could never be given back, but every day I give back from my heart to be able to uh, live life in a meaningful way. Would one of you gentlemen like to share? For me, I've run across that a, a couple of times and all I do is like my change when it started it was in honor of my victims and I understand that so even though we change even though we're in this rehabilitative restorative justice and and everybody accepts us with open arms I know there's people out there and all, all I do is I continue to be that example of change that like I for my brothers on the inside you know that we are that example that no matter what we've been through no matter what we've done in life that we can change and I start seeing like Mothers with the Message, um, they're, they're a group here in San Diego. What they did is they, a lot of them, all of them lost their sons, their husbands through gang violence. And I used to do it off the streets with them. And initially they were standoffish. They were like, you guys are the ones who took the lives of our children. But when they started seeing that we've changed, they started seeing our attitude, our demeanor, our, our heart, they started humanizing us. Now they go into the prisons. They go into the prisons and do victims awareness. They go in and help the brothers in there. And I would say to anybody that you just got to take the high road. You know, you just got to be that example of change that not be defined by the worst act that we committed in our past and start being defined by what we're doing here today to help not only brothers come home, but unify the families. That's what I, that's what I do when I come across that. Thank you, David. Would anyone else like to share? Yeah, I agree with David. Um, and even groups like Mothers with a Message, I've worked with them. And uh, but it, that's the tricky thing about forgiveness is like um, everybody has their own 
level of forgiveness. And for me to expect family and the uh, victims of my crime to forgive me, um, I can't make that happen. So I just try to live my life. I always use the uh, the organ analogy. Like if, if, if I was given a, a new lung to live, I have an obligation to eat right, not smoke, to whatever, to, to treat that with the best of my ability. And having a second chance out here on the streets, I think obviously we all feel the same that every day has to count for something. So it's, it's really all you can do is your part and, and hope that people see your heart and, and your good work does make a change. So Thank you, Matthew. And there's another You're question welcome. I want to I want to shout out one of the questions, and it, this will be more of an organizational question to uh, actually send some people this way. The question is: Is there a way to reconcile with victims since data shows that victims benefit from these types of restorative practices? Uh, uh, one of our partners that we do this work with is Healing Dialogues in Action, an amazing organization. Uh, I would say reach out at the end of this show. We will make sure that we have their information up. If you missed their information, reach out to us. We can connect you. Uh, with that organization. Uh, that's Healing Dialogues in Action. So so make sure you take an opportunity to reach out to them. Another question, and Eugene, Eugene, could you answer this question first? So what, do you, what is your mindset? So, so you spent decades inside of a, a system that's oppressive, that's negative. You, you find a way to turn all that around. You, you, you dig in, you change, you do that internal work, you come home. What type of mindset do you have to have to go back in to places like Corcoran uh, and give from the heart? What type of mindset does that take? It, honestly, uh, for me, it just takes uh, being selfless, putting everybody before myself because that, uh, at a point in time in my life, I, it was all about me. I was so hurt that I didn't care about the people around me. So I was just into hurting people and doing just what I wanted to do. So I had to become selfless and grow and understand that there's a lot of people incarcerated that don't know or don't have the information that was given to me from individuals such as you and my team members that go back in there every day and they do the work that we do. So for me, it's all about being selfless. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. About 12 minutes out, there's, there's, there's one other question that I want to ask you, gentlemen. And that question is uh, coming from our audience. So how quickly, one, how quickly can a person get in contact or get enrolled in, in Hope and Redemption programs, Jacob? Well, uh, you can contact us through mail, but to get into the program inside the institution, uh, you would have to fill out what's called the Form 22 uh, and send it to the CRM's office uh, to be put on the waiting list. Some of them waiting lists are longer than others, so I couldn't give you an exact time. Uh, there's also, uh, we, we try not to get involved in the process of putting people in the class because we don't want uh, people to, to feel like we're, we're showing any type of bias or anything. Um, but we do work with people who are going to the board uh, in, in a short amount of time to make sure that they have all the proper documents they need uh, to have a successful board hearing and come home to their family. But to, 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 the answer is that uh, it, it would have to go through the 22, you would have to fill out a, a Form 22, uh, CDCR Form 22, and send it to the community release, uh, community release manager's office to be processed into the group. Thank you, sir. There's a question, this, and, and many of us know this gentleman right here, uh, Johnny Howe, appreciate, appreciate your question, Johnny. Uh, Johnny, so uh, we'd love to be able to actually do a show with Johnny somewhere in the, in the future. This guy, imagine, up, a, future, imagine a future that was entirely different from, from what everybody thought he was. Real quickly, Johnny had been denied parole for 15 years. And he was asked a question in one of the, in one of the rehabilitative programs, uh, what are you going to be doing next year or five years from now? And Johnny said, oh, that's easy. I'm going to be here uh, because I just got denied 15 years. And the instructor of that class said, your job is to imagine a future that no one else can see. Johnny imagined a future of being released in the next three years, and Johnny is now home. Uh, turned his life around like he's an inspiration. I know he's an inspiration to me. Like, uh, literally, Johnny's home and, and giving back to the community. But his question is, uh, knowing people that have been out a short period of time and they're having struggles with finances, building credit and time management is that being addressed uh so is that being addressed jacob and caesar uh, absolutely absolutely so one of the things that we uh uh the message that we convey to our guys in there and and joseph and mark could attest to this is that time management you have to work on it because when you're in prison it's easy your schedule is very easy um but out here to to have a scheduled day you miss an hour it's an hour that you're not going to get back um, as far as uh, building credit, 
we do I do share as much information as possible on how I build my credit and how the stuff worked for me. We also had a Bank of America gave us a training on uh, financial empowerment, which was great. Um, yeah, I think time management is extremely important. That's something that we struggle with, uh, being coming from institutions where uh, our time is managed for us. So uh, uh, I think time management is really paramount to be successful out here and, 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 and it's something I struggle with still to this day. Uh, as far as credit is concerned, I think uh, it would be wise to find out what credit is and why you need it. I didn't know anything about credit. Uh, and um, I think that uh, it, we need to start providing some financial literacy classes and that's on me. I'll work on that. Uh, thank you for, for putting me up on it. And, and, and money management is a part for me. It's a, it's a part of uh, it's a part of the credit and everything because um, we have to learn how to pay bills and uh, 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 be responsible out here. And that's part of managing your money and budgeting. A lot of that we do with the canteen already inside. So uh, it's just a matter of, of transferring a lot of the skills we use on the inside to the outside. So we also have a financial literacy program or, or class that we run at ARC. Uh, we have the, the curriculum. We have one through Bank of America, and we, all, we also have one that we've developed specifically uh, for formerly incarcerated people. One last point, uh, Ernesto Gonzalez, I agree that computer work is also something that's vitally important. Based on the cuts in the governor's budget next year, a lot of the, the computer literacy that was going to be coming into Department of Corrections uh, um, is not going to be there because of uh, COVID-19 and budget issues. Uh, but for people that have come home, write this down. GCF Learn for free. It's a computer-based tutorial that will walk you through every different level of Microsoft Office, emails, you name it, for the person who's never sat in front of a computer uh, before. That's GCF Learn free. I want to go to uh, closing now. So for each of you, and be as brief as possible if you can. Uh, one of the best parts for me is... Um... When, you know, when I show up on Monday uh, to see their faces, well, most uh, some of them tell me, you know what, you're like my visit. I don't get no visits, but you, I can't wait for Monday. Usually we hate Mondays, right? But they, I go to Corcoran on Monday, they, they're they waiting for me. There's 20, 30 inmates right there, just participants, just waiting for me to show up there, and they're so glad to see me. And, and it just brings me joy that, that I could do that for them, you know? And uh, they're, they're, like, they're like my brothers now. You know, I, I, I hold them, you know, accountable and they hold me accountable. I got to show up every Monday. I love that. Thank you. Uh, Caesar. could you tell us your uh, last thought for the day and your favorite part of this job? Um, I believe that my favorite part is uh, road trips. I believe uh, we get to know each other a lot more. We, 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 we let our guard down and it's great to be in a vehicle with these men. Uh, for a numerous amounts of hours and just BSing back and forth, uh, I, I really love that. And um, my favorite part of the team, the, my, my favorite part of doing this work, also is when I see the guys come home. When I see the guys come home, I think that's just man, that's it, all the sacrifices are worth it. Seeing them home, especially when they land at ARC, I love that. Thank you, brother. Robert, could you tell us your favorite part of the job? Started off a ripple effect. Be concise. Uh, you know what? Before we we started to understand ripple effect and the destructive nature of, of, of the way we were living in our lifestyles, how we affected our community in a negative way. However, today we're still uh, having ripple effect on our community, and ARC gives me the ability and that space to continue to thrive. Not only myself, but to continue to thrive with my brothers that are getting out in the institutions. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Eugene, could you tell us your favorite part of the job? Yes, my favorite part of the job is when I walk into the institutions and those street clothes and the guys that I spent 20 plus years with on the level fours, when they look up and they see me, they don't even realize who I am until I tell them my name. That's beautiful. And my last thought is when we wake up, we wake up blessed. So if we start our day there, then everything else is, is just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Matthew, could you tell us uh, your favorite part of the job? Um, yeah, definitely. My, first, my last thought uh, is if COVID didn't teach us nothing else, is that class, money, where you live, I'm, we all human. At the end, we all have the same needs. So let's remember that coming out of this. So, uh, but going in, one, I'd have to roll with what Eugene said real quick. Um, like people will come up and say, you guys are hoping the flesh and, and, by no means am I God or nothing. You guys know where I stand with that. But 
just to hear that and for them to see a guy that was in their shoes come out and give them that hope makes it right every time. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Carlos, yeah. uh, favorite part of the job? Favorite part of the job is when we're running curriculum and then we tell them that we're former lifers, that I committed murder, that I was sentenced to 29th to life, that I'm still on parole and I have the keys. You see the light change and throughout the course, people start changing their behaviors, their attitudes, and you see the change in the hope and inspiration that art gives. And my closing statement is, choice is a ninth chance determines your destiny by Aristotle. Thank you. Thank you. David, favorite part of the job? Man, my favorite part of the job, bro, is uh, going in there and seeing them brothers come in with the mean mug at the first class and they start peeling away at their defects. And when they have that aha moment, when they're that pain, that trauma, because I'm a firm believer that the, the behaviors and actions that led us to prison, that led us to the violence, was just covering up the core, that pain, that trauma, whatever we might have experienced in our childhood. And for them to break through and share it and then start seeing the flood of everybody opening up and healing within them classes, that's my favorite. And uh, my closing statement is for those people listening, if you have loved ones in there, just be that ear. Just be that ear. Listen, because me, when I did my 25 years in prison, all I wanted is somebody to care enough to listen, to give me guidance and to believe in me until I was able to believe in myself. And that's all them brothers and sisters are looking for in there. Okay. Uh, yeah. So Sam, um, one of the things that, that, I, that I learned and I value today is uh, being of service, uh, paying it forward and giving back. So like for me, that's my purpose, bro, in, in life. And in that I'm able to be remorseful you know what I'm saying? To take ownership of the life like I said, that I had no right to take. You know what I'm saying? Living amends, you know, to make sure nothing like that ever happens again. So I, I can add value now, bro, like to my family, to my community. You know, I can even, you know, just sprinkle myself and, and, and with everybody, like just adding my chance of making the world a better place. So it's just not a cliche, but I'm really trying to do this through, through these things. Uh, being Paying it forward, being of service and, and giving back. So my work, man, I'm part of that change in the institution, changing the narrative between administration and staff. That's like crazy. They trust me now, they're giving me a key, giving me alarms. They trust me and my, my, my coworkers. Cause like this is, I'm feeling something right now, but I feel good about that. I feel good, Sam, on the real. I'm, my family's proud of me, my mom is proud of me, my community's proud of me, man. So the work that I'm doing with ARC and then the whole redemption team is a home run for me, man. So thank you for allowing me to share that. Uh, so we're going to have to definitely do a definition on what brief is for some of them. <laughs> Carlos, don't you have someone you're supposed to share with us? Yes, my baby's at the doctor's appointment, Sam. I'm sorry. Okay. I had a baby a month ago. and hey, I'm a on, Wait, 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 wait. Slow down. So, so one to just, uh, one, so Eugene, Joseph, Robert, and Carlos all have newborn babies. Uh, 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 and they were supposed to all share, like, this is part when you talk about hope and redemption and the possibilities of what's possible, Joseph being able to be a father to his daughter, uh, Robert being able to be a father to his son, Eugene being able to be a father to his son, Carlos being able to be a father. I love that baby ARC t-shirt, check that out, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but just want you to know like these are human beings for, for people who might say, well, why? This is a, a, a generation where we're breaking the cycle, changing the, the, the way things have done, been done for a long time. And these are men that, have, that, that continuously give back to our communities, make our communities safer and help our communities uh, heal. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for sharing. Show your picture, uh, Carlos, put it up there to the, to the uh, there's, there's, there's Carlos, newborn baby, uh, Marcus is. That's right. Beautiful babies, beautiful families. I want to thank you all, gentlemen, for uh, joining us. Uh, I'm going to close out now, and I want to thank everyone uh, everyone else uh, for being here. I want you to take a moment uh, to watch this video. We're going to play the video, and then I'd like to share with you a little bit about the Read Matter 2 campaign. Okay, so we're having a little bit of technical difficulty, but want to share. Uh, we launched in conjunction, I mentioned this earlier on in the show, that we launched our hashtag we matter to campaign in, in partnership with commons organization called imagine justice this is a nationwide call for 
the decrease of the populations in state and local facilities across the nation. We're asking that our electeds, that our leaders take into consideration in order to be able to do social, uh, in order to be able to do uh, social distancing, to please, please make space in our institutions. Uh, these are not places, we don't want people to die inside these places. Uh, as you get a chance, please Google hashtag we matter too. Check out the video, it is powerful. Uh, also, if you look on, uh, if you go on the website, you'll see different activations across the nation. Again, hashtag we matter too, meaning that the people that are currently incarcerated and facilities across this nation, they're part of our families, they're part of our communities, and yes, they matter too. Uh, so please, uh, uh, if you have time also, you can check out uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, all of our fireside chats. Next week, next week, check this out. Uh, I'll have a guest by the name of Pamela Wynn, who's a powerful lady who did, who's uh, formerly incarcerated and uh, went through some difficulties inside. And our conversation is going to be about uh, pregnant women, incarceration, and family separation, things that shouldn't happen. I want to like give a huge shout out to New York's uh, governor, uh, releasing the women that, that are pregnant, that are in their facilities. We need to do more. We need to do more. These, these, these are human beings. These are babies too. Like it scares me and breaks my heart to think that uh, we can lose lives when we don't have to. Uh, with that, I want to thank you all for being here. Again, uh, call to action, Google hashtag we matter too, and check out the activations across the nation. Thank you. This is Sam Lewis and we're signing off from our fireside chat. Appreciate you all.